if you work hard and you genuinely care, people roll out the red carpet for mm-hmm. you and want to show you everything that they know and, and how to be successful. And that really, for me, was fantastic in that, you know, if you if you can find a maintenance supervisor, a mod superintendent, uh, maybe early in the day for a few minutes and before they get really started and they can take a few minutes and teach you something and you can show them that you really want to learn, then some really great things start to happen. And uh, I was pretty fortunate to, uh, over the years, align myself with a lot of really great folks. And and that's really, I guess, the, the key, at least for my career, and especially in the early innings. Hello, and welcome to the Elevator Careers podcast, sponsored by the Allred Group. I am your host, Matt Allred. In this podcast, we talk to the people whose lives and careers are dedicated to the vertical transportation industry to inform and share lessons learned building upon the foundation of those who have gone before to inspire the next generation of elevator careers. Today, our guest is Ed Stahowiak, Chief Operating Officer at Axiom Elevator. Ed started his career as a sales rep with Otis Elevator in Syracuse, New York, where he learned and grew rapidly. In 2023, Ed became one of the founders of Axiom Elevator with a vision to become the elevator service provider of choice. Ed believes personal and business growth is not easy. It takes a lot of courage to have honest and open conversations, but it's essential to see your blind spots and grow effectively. This is part one of the interview with Ed. Today, we will discuss his early career. In part two, we'll be discussing the challenges and learnings of starting a new business. So Ed, welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I'm excited to be able to to talk today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure and especially to, to kind of dig a little deeper into getting to know you and uh, would love to start with just your career and how did you come to the elevator industry? Yeah, it wasn't on the, uh, wasn't on the short list of what I wanted to be when I was a little kid. And, uh, I didn't have a family member in the industry. Uh, the way that I entered the elevator industry was straight out of college. Uh, so I was recruited straight out of school. It was back when UTC and Otis were, were collectively okay. together before they decoupled and, uh, was recruited straight out of school and, and really saw, a company that was a lot like a family in the branch operating structure. Uh, and well, where in, were you going to school, if I may? Clarkson University in upstate New York. So they just came on campus and uh, yeah. say, hey, we want to interview some of your best and brightest. And I don't go. know about that part. I think <laughs> I, I might have snuck my way into the interview process. But uh, I had a really neat opportunity to interview with two, two gentlemen, uh, Jim O'Reilly and Tim Reedy. And I think... Uh, Interview started at eight and I might have snuck in at 730 before someone and and weaseled my way in for an interview. But uh I guess the rest was history from that from that day forward. But those what two gentlemen it? were responsible, I guess, for for hiring me. What was it that, that captured your attention, especially going from like zero interest, zero knowledge of what what even is this? What was it that kind of sparked that fire? Yeah, I think uh I probably didn't know it at the time. Uh but I really enjoyed learning about the culture and the people that they had on campus. And there was a significant contingency of folks that had joined the company or really had joined UTC sure. uh, in various capacities. And so uh, that was obviously very exciting. And uh, I guess I didn't know, obviously, at the time that it would be a career decision. I, I was looking, I guess, at that point for a job. But, uh, sure, you know, I think that was really the first piece. The second thing I think that I researched and i guess found through that research and you have to remember back then research was a little bit different this was i'm gonna date myself a little bit but it wasn't you know while google was was you know in its early infancies uh information wasn't as readily available so you actually had to spend time hunting for it but i think you know in researching the company you could see that their financial performance had been strong and in making a transition out of school and into uh, a job in an industry it made a lot of sense to go someplace that, you know, was doing a good job. So I think those were probably the two things that were steering me that direction. I had no idea, you know, what I was getting myself into, I guess, but, uh, right. Right. Just looking off. for a first job, let alone, yeah. you know, maybe I'll do this for two years and then I'll, then I'll find something else. Right. <laughs> yeah. I guess I, I never, you know, I guess I never looked at it as being short-term or long-term. I just, I just jumped into it and then, uh, I don't know, it took off from there. What was it that kind of clicked for you that, that, made you start saying, oh my gosh, this is, this is pretty cool. I can keep doing this. Yeah. Uh, I think the first thing was I saw the folks around me, their careers grow and blossom and, and they were, 
you know, around the country, uh, maybe a year or two ahead of me, so to speak, in, okay. in kind sure. of their tenure uh, in various capacities and seeing them take on roles of increased responsibility and be responsible for managing, uh, whether it's a small P&L or an operation or, uh, you know, maybe even just a project or two. And uh, that was really exciting. Uh, yeah. And I think the other piece was, you know, our industry as a culture, and I'm sure you've heard this a, a million times, but if you work hard and you genuinely care, people roll out the red carpet for mm-hmm. you and want to show you everything that they know and, and how to be successful. And that really, for me, was fantastic in that, you know, if you if you can find a maintenance supervisor, a mod superintendent, uh, maybe early in the day for a few minutes and before they get really started and they can take a few minutes and teach you something and you can show them that you really want to learn, then some really great things start to happen. And uh, I was pretty fortunate to, uh, over the years, align myself with a lot of really great folks. And and that's really, I guess, the the key, at least for my career, and especially in the early innings. Yeah. Now, who, who are some of those folks that really you felt like took a took an interest in you, your career, yeah. and said, yeah. hey, I, I want to invest some time in you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's... it's uh, it's interesting. So one of those people is actually currently our CEO of Axiom today, Jeremy Metzger, uh, who I've, I guess, reported to directly or indirectly four times throughout my career. Uh, so certainly a known quantity. I think we've known each other 17 or 18 years. Uh, wow. So as we kicked off Axiom and really, really were building up this company from the ground up, uh, there was a really short learning curve, I guess, collectively between the two of us, how to work together. But um, so he was certainly one of them. And then I would say, uh, there's a few other folks. Chris Tedeschi, namely, is one of them. I still talk to him, actually, even as recent as text messages the other day. Um, oh. And I think what you find is in a small branch operating structure, you become in a weird way, almost like family, um, which right. is really not the norm, especially in the industry uh, today, as it was really back then. I think you can create that culture still, but you know, it's a lot more difficult in all the highly matrixed organizations, especially the Fortune 50 or Fortune 100. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it seemed like you came in at a at a good time with with a mm-hmm. good group of people and and really yeah. could see the upward movement. And it's like, oh yeah. my gosh, that dude's only been at it for two years. He's two yeah. years ahead of me. So in two years, I could be doing that. It's wild, yeah. I mean, I think that you know that certainly was the model and is the model for the most part in a lot of the majors is you know continue to take on roles of increased responsibility and and perhaps even relocate if if it makes sense for call it all parties involved, but uh, right. You know, it's, it's a little bit different, I think, today than it was then. And the post-COVID world's obviously changed uh, True. the way people Absolutely. are looking at their employer and, and the employer-employee relationship. Sure, sure. What what were some of your initial challenges or or maybe just like, oh, my gosh, I'm, you know, I, I don't know if I can figure this out. Or, you know, did you feel like you hit any of those obstacles, I mean, walls? All of the above. Yeah, it's <laughs> so... I think for anybody entering in the industry, the product knowledge component and and of what we physically do in the field um, can be really daunting. And there's really no easy way around it other than just rolling up your sleeves and diving in. And, um, you know, I was pretty fortunate to spend a, a lot of my early career just observing and, and watching and was given that opportunity to see how, you know, you do everything from uh, adjust I'm trying to think of something that I saw that was pretty interesting. Oh, a linear selector to, you know, watching somebody do a rope job to how you balance a cab. I mean, just, you know, watching poetry in motion, if you will, just doing wow. our everyday stuff. And, you know, without that, without access to that, uh, it becomes very difficult to do, I, I think, a couple of things. One, articulate to a customer, perhaps, the nuance and how difficult it is, inherently difficult and inherently dangerous what we do on a database it's really nice right. i think that's the person right. the second thing is until you're sitting there or or you know perhaps even if you ever had an opportunity to work in the field um, understand the work that is actually occurring it's very difficult to appreciate it and very difficult to understand the challenges that uh our people throughout our industry face on a day-to-day basis uh, right. and without that i think it it's incredibly difficult to in at least a you know, future state or a role further on down your career be responsible for those folks if you don't truly understand how difficult it is Uh, and so i was very lucky to have that opportunity early on in my career and gain that appreciation for how difficult our business is Uh, you know especially yeah if you're leading an ops team for example maybe you're running a branch or or something and 
Um, I just, I know early in my career, that was, there was always this issue ops and sales. Well, sales is over promising and we can't, you know, we can't do that. And they keep selling it, you know, like we can. And, you know, so uh, mm -hmm. not that that ever happens in this industry, but I think <laughs> being able to understand that and appreciate it, what, what your team actually can do yeah. makes a huge difference. Yeah. It's interesting. You, you bring up kind of that classic manufacturing bottleneck and subsequent bullwhip effect. And uh, you see it in really every facet of our business. And really the, the goal, especially as a leader, is to push that bottleneck as far down the line as you can until it boomerangs back around to the front end of the sales process and then continue to do that. I think the challenge is most people don't understand that that's just an inherent part of growth or inherent mm -hmm. part of the business. And so, you know, as you're navigating call to day to day, I think helping the team around you really understand what it is that is happening, call it in the business, around the business, and in the day to day becomes mission critical. Uh, because I genuinely still to this day don't believe people wake up and say, I'm going to do a really terrible job at work today. You know, it just it just doesn't happen. I mean, I think people genuinely care. They want to win. They want to be a part of a high performing team. They believe that they that they have a ton to contribute uh, and it's unlocking that talent. And I think the first one, uh, first part of doing that is making sure people understand exactly what it is that, you know, enables them to be successful and enables the team to be successful and what those roadblocks are and that this thing happened or this thing is happening to us, but it's as a, a byproduct of these other three things. And I think oftentimes it's hard to see those levers uh, being pulled kind of behind the scenes when you're in the day-to-day -day trenches. Um, sure. and, you know, I think you have to have a little faith in the process, regardless of where you are from a, uh, which seat you're sitting in and that, you know, the people around you genuinely are doing the same that you are and wanting to be successful. And um, you have to have a little faith in your team. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, we're all in this together and yeah, it's going to yeah. hurt sometimes and let's just, let's just, you know, get through it yeah. and make it happen again and hopefully you'll do better next time. And yeah, all yeah, those yeah. things. Yeah, that's cool. Um, what would you say is is the single greatest thing or you know, one of the greatest things you've learned throughout your career? Yeah, I mean, there's, I don't know, there's probably a zillion of those I could share. I guess it's, I wouldn't even say it's industry related. I think it's probably just more uh, a general, call it thought and, and life lesson, but um and I wouldn't even call it a trick per se. I think it's just the way, the, the proper way to lead a team or to be a part of a team is um, create a culture and and treat people in a, in a manner that creates an environment where people do the things that need to be done, not because you're telling them to do it or because they have to, but more so because they, they don't want to let you down. Um, and that is, I think that is the difference between companies being good and companies being great. And you know, I think as a part of that, what you find is, you know, people will forget things that you say, but they'll never forget the way you make them feel. Um, and in our industry, we have people from all different backgrounds and all different educations and, right. and you know, who are on various stages in their career and in their life. Uh, and so, you know, to thread a needle on whatever it is, making a business plan, getting a an elevator back in service, figuring out the right way to handle a certain situation, uh, you know, whether it's in the office or in the field, uh, is inherently difficult. And I think at the end of the day, those principles, you know, are genuine and, and are the reason why, you know, great companies continue to thrive. Um, but it's there's no shortage of opportunities to mess those those situations up, right? So on a day-to-day -day right. basis, you're always trying to get better. And I think as a part of that process, you have to be a little vulnerable. You have to be a little vulnerable with those around you. And you also have to be a little vulnerable and, and look yourself in the mirror and say, wow, maybe I could have handled that one a little bit differently or, you know, and, and share that with the team. Because I think everybody as they, especially when you're working in a tight knit group and, and, you know, you're relying on sales, relying on operations, operations, are relying on sales and right. call it all and in, in all together. Uh, you know, those things become mission critical to the success of of the branch operation and, and to ultimately to the business. Well, I think it goes back to what you said a, a few minutes ago with it. Nobody wakes up and says, I'm going to do a, a horrible job, right? They, everybody wants to come through for their team. Everybody wants yeah. to to succeed and, and have the team succeed. And and so knowing that that the leader, like you said, makes you feel like, hey, he, he values me as an individual mm -hmm. and I trust him. And there's this this bond here that I want to maintain that, right? I'm not, you know, and if I screw something up, then I'm just going to come forward and say, hey, <laughs> I totally screwed something up. 
no. versus versus trying to hide it or trying to pretend it didn't happen or blame somebody else or because hey i can trust this leader so i think that's huge yeah it's really hard to do i mean if you've just entered an organization or you're you know maybe early in your career it's hard to come to the forefront and say i think i messed this one up what should i do or here's how i'm planning on handling i mean it's usually the last thing you want to do you want to move really fast and try and fix something so that nobody finds out maybe but uh, that's probably the worst thing you can do because there's so much, you know, wealth of knowledge that could probably help you do it differently and yeah. really learn from it. And I think yeah, that's one of the things that in our, in our industry right now is really important is, are we taking the time to really go and teach and coach all of the apprentices that are, that are in our industry right now that are joining our industry um, to degree that, you know, perhaps folks did it for us. And you know, it's a challenge. It's a balancing act. And and across the industries, I think you're seeing, you know, the independent elevator community really thrive by leveraging that as an opportunity. Um, and, and candidly, I think the folks that have joined independent elevator companies are getting a quote unquote better education from, you know, start to finish because they're able to see a lot of different vintages of equipment and get experience and exposure to all different lines and maybe not work all in, you know, one segment of the business, whether it's construction or, or mod versus, you know, Perhaps others would. Yeah. What What do you think it is that some some companies may have lost sight of? I mean, you're you're talking about you know just making sure that you're mentoring and teaching and and where does that get lost? I guess I don't know if it's necessarily lost. I think it's just as businesses move from call it one phase to the next. If you go from true growth or startup into kind of that middle phase versus you know prior to going into call it that larger or you know almost major or, or matrix to organization you're just in different phases and as you transition from one to the next you start to see more and more specialization and you know silos and certain key portions of the business just because it's so large you don't have a choice so i don't think it's that anybody's quote-unquote lost anything i just think it's very difficult to manage a business of size and scale without specialization and and growth Yeah, a lot of a lot of growing pains, and and when you're in that, you know, it's easy, easy to take your eye off one ball and focus on another ball because hey, they're all flying pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, what? Uh, so I want to kind of, um, I guess, ask as we uh, want to, what I like to do is kind of wrap up just part one around your career by asking what yeah. advice would you give to somebody who's who's new to this industry? Yeah. So when you take a step back and kind of look at my career, you know, I don't know if gone are the days, but, and maybe I'm going to make myself sound a little old, Matt. I don't feel old, but, um, you know, maybe gone are the days where people join an organization and say, I can see myself here for my entire career. I can see myself here for 20 years or right. what, whatever it may be. Uh, and so back when my career started and the question was, how do you get real world experience without perhaps leaving an organization. And, you know, the balance of, you know, there's a, there's a big wide world out there, but I really like where I'm at. How do I, how do I manage both of those uh, without having to potentially leave? And so the reason why I tell that story and and it's something that actually our, our CEO, Jeremy and I had many conversations about and it was one of the reasons why I really focused on both real world experience and education and took the opportunity to, to go and seek out multiple degrees and specializations and consulting work and, and other opportunities to kind of gain that worldly experience without having to really change roles or lead the organization. But um, I think it's to continue to have that thirst for knowledge, to be open and honest and candid with the folks around you. Like we've discussed earlier about the things that you would love to be able to accomplish and do and put, plans in place in order to do it um you know it's it's like that age-old question what do you want to do when you grow up and and i'm still saying i'm not sure but i'll let you know when i when i get there and right. you know some would say okay well you you've already done a lot you know when's enough is enough and the answer is i don't know i feel like i'm still just getting started and i think that's that you know thirst for knowledge and continuing to be inquisitive and and really trying to look at every opportunity to learn that I think is probably the the major key for this industry. And, and I know we'll talk a lot more kind of later on, perhaps about the business and the industry, but, you know, the pace of innovation and change in technology is happening so quickly. 
right. that if you aren't looking at every opportunity as a learning opportunity, it's going to be really difficult to keep up as we go forward. You know, we as a group of of elevator folks for the longest time said, oh, geez, we're going from relay logic to microprocessor, like the world's getting flipped upside down. And right. we're going to look back in the not so distant future and say that was nothing compared to what we're about to transition into from, you know, everything from the cellular technology coupled with AGI and everything else that's coming down the pipeline from a technology perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And and what I'm hearing from you is, is you know, take every opportunity because you never know where it's going to lead you. And if you take yeah. those opportunities there to, to learn, to grow, to, to develop, yeah. what you're going to find is there's a whole bunch of, of new opportunities that you could not have seen from the other side that are now Yeah, presented. it's the age old quote, like the, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And it's kind of right along those lines but i think you have to to work hard and you have to work smart and really continue to push yourself it's really easy to get comfortable in really any role especially right. i think in our industry and you know that inquisitive thought and wanting to learn more and pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone um, it's really important and i guess really the way i describe it is you're working call it for the business but you also want to be working on yourself and, and continuing to improve your core skill set uh, and I think that's super important, especially as, you know, you kind of traverse your career and get more and more opportunities. And people always are are uh, perhaps a little nervous or scared to take a lateral role. And I'm sure you have a lot of conversations with people sure. about their, <laughs> their career path and how they navigate it. But, you know, in order to be a truly effective leader, you have to have uh, a really strong basic fund of knowledge around really all key disciplinary topics within. Right call it the average day in the life of of the business. And so you can't just know a whole bunch about operations or or sales or maybe finance if you truly want to be a leader and represent, you know, either a significant PL or or a business, because at the end of the day, you're gonna be making decisions that have wide sweeping ramifications. And you know, you have to really understand how the that's going to impact the business in kind of all of those areas or arenas. So, you know, I think that's one of the the arguments or the use cases for why it's right. really important to get that exposure but it's really hard to do that when you're when you're sitting there saying geez you know i could continue to do this for a long long time and there's these opportunities staring ahead of me i don't know if i want to take a step sideways or geez this kind of feels backwards is this the right thing to do right. uh, but you know i think you always have to calm yourself down and say you got plenty of time to figure it out there's no rush right uh, you know yep absolutely thank you awesome yeah. ed thank you so much for being with me today yeah thanks matt it was fun Thank you. I appreciate it. And I wish you the best as you continue to build the business. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Elevator Careers podcast, sponsored by the Allred Group, a leader in elevator industry recruiting. You can check us out online at elevatorcareers.net. Please subscribe. And until next time, stay safe.